I hope everyone's doing well this afternoon. We will be talking a little bit about what, in my opinion, is the best Parsha of the year, Parsha's Baloscha, and uh, that's because it's my Bar Mitzvah Parsha. So, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it is definitely a great Parsha. So let's uh, start at the beginning. If you have an Art Scroll Chumash, it's on page 774, this is an Art Scroll Chumash. If you don't own one of these, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's the Chumash we use during the Parsha class when we meet in... Uh, in person, which hasn't happened in a long time. In last week's Parsha, we had the uh, Nesim, which was where the heads of the tribes brought sacrifices. And each, we mentioned each head of the tribe brought a sacrifice, and they each brought the same sacrifice, so all heads of the 12 tribes brought the sacrifice. And then we start this week's Parsha, and we have the commandment to Aaron to light the menorah, which is in the Mishkan, which is in the tabernacle, and which will be in the base of Migdash. So, as we mentioned actually last week when we discussed the juxtaposition between Sota and Nazir, two parshas in the Torah, after the Torah talks about Sota, which we mentioned last week was the waters that a, a woman suspected of adultery would drink, and then we talk about Nazir, which is a commandment where somebody could take on extra mitzvos in the Torah if he wants. So they're juxtaposed, and we discussed last week why they are close to each other. So here we could ask the same question. Why is it that after we finish reading in last week's Parsha of all of the sacrifices brought by the heads of the tribes to inaugurate the Mishkan, right? this was the beginning of the Mishkan, the beginning of the tabernacle, the service therein, we, we, we um, discuss all of the... Um, we discuss the sacrifices that were brought by the heads of the tribe, and then right after, in the beginning of this week's Parsha, we talk about the menorah. So what is the reason, right? The Torah just doesn't write things willy-nilly. It's not in any random order. There's a specific reason uh, for the order of everything in the Torah and the way the Torah writes something. So what is the uh, purpose of this? So Rashi uh, is already on this. Rashi explains. Right, of course, Rashi, for those that are just joining us for the Chumash here for the first time, Rashi is the, I would say, like the main commentary on the Torah. He lived in France in the uh, ten hundreds, and he just explains the simple meaning of the... Uh, of the psukim, how to understand them, using the oral Torah um, to explain it. So he writes, Lama nismacha parshas menorah la parshas hanasim. Why is the Torah talk about the menorah right next to the nasim, where the heads of the tribes brought the sacrifices? Lafisha kishara Aaron chanukas hanasim chalsha as daito. When Aaron saw, who was the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, when he saw all of the heads of the tribes bringing the sacrifices, he got a little disappointed or sad, you could say. He didn't have a portion uh, in that. It was only the uh, heads of the Israelite tribes that had a uh, portion to inaugurate the temple, to inaugurate the Mishkan, whereas Aaron, who was the head of the uh, Kohanim and the Levim, he did not participate in his shevet, his tribe did not participate in the inauguration of the uh, t tabernacle, so he was uh, a little upset about it, a little disappointed. Hashem said to him, Your portion is greater than their portion. You are going to uh, light the candles in the uh, Mishkan, which happens every day. So, since Aaron felt upset, that he didn't have a chance to participate in the inauguration of the uh, of the tabernacle. Hashem gave him the mitzvah of menorah, which happens every day, so that he would uh, he would have a, a portion in it. So that was the commentary of Rashi, but the Ramban um, says a different shot. This is a different explanation. The Ramban, of course, was uh, is, is also one of the most uh, famous commentaries, one of the most insightful commentaries on the Torah. He lived in the 12, 1300s in Spain, had a famous debate with Pablo Cristiani to defend the Jewish religion, and he won. But unfortunately, he was exiled from Spain and had to go to Israel after the church came after him. Okay, so he writes, he brings, first he brings Rashi, he quotes Rashi, the question, why is it that we have the story, the commandment of Aaron to light the candles, light the menorah, right next to the inauguration of the temple of Fi? He was upset. He didn't get a, a chance to participate in the inauguration. 
Barley. The Ramban says, I do not understand the explanation of Rashi. Why would the fact that Aaron gets to get to light the menorah, why would that make him feel any better? Well, why specifically the menorah? There's something called katoris. After each sacrifice is brought, right, we bring a daily sacrifice in the temple. Uh, the Kohanim bring it, uh, offer it in the morning and in the evening. And along with that sacrifice, there's a katoris. Katoris, um, which are the incense, were burnt. And that was a very, Shashiv uh, Chabal, of the Torah speaks very highly of the incense. That was done twice a day. And Aaron already did that. So Aaron already had something that he did every day in the temple. Why is the menorah going to make him feel any better? What does that add to it? And he says also, Minchas, right? Ubechol Korbanus, he also brought sacrifices every day. And he brought the, the Mincha sacrifice. Not only that, Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. There's a very special service in the temple. It's the only day of the year that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, goes into the Holy of Holies. And the entire service is performed by the high priest, which is Aaron. So, Not only that, who serves in the temple every day? The Kohanim and the Levim. Only the Kohanim and Levim. Me, I'm, a, I'm an Israelite. I would have no opportunity to serve in the temple. They would not allow me. No matter how much I donated, I would not be allowed. No matter how much I wanted to, how much I tried. If you have to be a Kohen, born a Kohen. There's nothing, absolutely nothing you could do if you're not born a Kohen to serve in the temple. So the Ramban's asking, why? So Aaron felt upset because he wasn't part of the inauguration of the temple. So according to Rashi, what made him feel better? That he could light the menorah every day. So the Ramban asks, why should that make him feel better? He already did the Ketores. He brought many sacrifices in the temple. Um, and he did the service of Yom Kippur. Uh, like, how's it making him feel better? And then the Ramban continues to ask, V'od, ma tam Why should he feel, uh, why should he be upset? He says, also, Aaron participated in the sacrifices of the inauguration. He helped. He did other uh, acts. He participated. He didn't actually bring the sacrifice himself, but he participated in it with the, uh, when the, when the uh, priests of the tribes brought the sacrifices. So, again, why was Aaron upset, and how did this make him feel better? So the Ramban gives a different answer. He explains what was it that Aaron got that made him feel good. He says that Aaron was Aaron felt better, not because he was given the mitzvah to light the menorah in the temple every day. That's not what the Medrash is referring to. It's referring to the menorah that would happen in the times of Hanukkah. That the menorah in the times of Hanukkah, who did the miracle? Who performed the miracle? Who fought against the Greeks? Right? The Greeks came into Israel and they tried to make us abandon Judaism. Right? The Greeks famously only believed in what the senses could perceive. They were philosophers, but only what you could uh, observe with the senses. Uh, spirituality, which can't be observed with the physical senses, they did not believe in, whereas Judaism totally rejects that view. We believe that the, not only is there a spiritual, but that's the purpose of life, is spirituality. And the Greeks tried to destroy our faith, tried to destroy our connection to Hashem. And it was a very few people who stood up to fight the Greeks. Many Jews joined the Greeks, right? Unfortunately, you've had that throughout time, where Jewish people join our enemies. Now, who was it that stood up against the Greeks to fight? It was Aaron and his children. It was the Kohanim. And through them, we know the story, they defeated the Greeks miraculously, and they rededicated the temple. There was only one jug of oil. And what did they light? What did they do to rededicate the temple? They lit the menorah. So the Ramban says, that's what it's referring to here. It's not referring to the menorah that was lit every day in the temple, in the Mishkan. It's referring to the menorah of Hanukkah. It says in Medrash, He says, since the 12 tribes, all of the princes brought inauguration, sacrifices, except for the tribe of Levi, 
say to Aaron and his children, There is another inauguration that's going to happen. There is going to be another dedication of the temple, which will occur, and that is going to happen through the Kohanim. And that's the Hanukkah that we all know and celebrate. And that's why this Parsha happens to the Nesim, right? What does Hanukkah mean? Hanukkah is when we rededicated the temple after the Greeks defiled it. It's an inauguration of the temple. That's what's happening in this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha is the first inauguration of the Mishkan, the first inauguration of the temple. And why do we have Baloscha right after? The reason we have Baloscha right after is because that is talking about, it's hinting to the menorah, which will be lit in the future, which will be a rededication during the times of the temple after it was uh, defiled. And who was going to do that rededication? Aaron and his children, the Kohanim. While they didn't participate primarily in the original inauguration of the Mishkan, they will participate and they will do the uh, inauguration of, the, of, of Hanukkah time. And he says, not only that, he says, while all of the sacrifices in the temple, when we're in Gullus, right, I'll, I'll read it inside actually. He says, right. He says that the sacrifices, when we don't have a temple, we don't bring sacrifices, right? If you ever, anyone's been to Yerushalayim, you see the temple, the temple mount there. There's a mosque there now, or a, a shrine. And there's no temple. We don't perform sacrifices. But you know what we do do every year? We light the Hanukkah candles. That still happens. Even when we're in exile, even when we're in Gullus, we still light the Hanukkah candles. And that is being hinted to in this week's Parsha, that the Nesim, they brought sacrifices to inaugurate the temple. And even though in Aaron, he, uh, as a Kohen, he brought sacrifices, he did the service on Yom Kippur, he did the Ketores, and he did all of that. But that doesn't occur, that doesn't happen. We're not privileged to have that when the Jewish people are in Gullus or in, or in exile, when we don't have a temple. But what we are privileged to have is the Hanukkah candles, the Hanukkah menorah, which uh, applies for all time. And interestingly, the Rambam points out that in last week's Parsha, we also had another mitzvah of the Kohanim that applies for all time, which is Birkas Kohanim. There's a mitzvah that the Kohanim bless the congregation, which is something that Ashkenazim do on Yantiv and Svartim do every day, where the Kohanim get up and they bless the entire congregation. And that applies even when we're in Gullus, even when we're exiles. So these two mitzvahs, the menorah, which the menorah of Hanukkah and the, um, and the blessing of the Kohanim apply for all times, while the uh, korbanos, while the sacrifices uh, do not. Okay, that was topic one. I would like to do one more topic. About Pesach Sheni, the, uh, did you know there's two Passovers? We're going to learn about that, God willing. So 7-9, Zion Tess, if you have a Chumash. Hmm, I think it's 9-7. So what happened was, there were, the rule is, uh, back in the day when we had Pesach, when we had a temple, we were in the desert for the first year, we had a Mishkan, uh, in addition to all of the mitzvahs of the Seder, right, you have Matzah, Marah, and all that, there was also Korban Pesach, which was a sacrifice, the Paschal Lamb, we, everyone had a lamb, uh, there was groups formed, you bring, bring a lamb, Erev Pesach is sacrificed, and then you eat it as part of the Seder, it was a big, big mitzvah on Pesach. So the rule is, is that if someone was away from uh, the camp or was impure, spiritually impure, they weren't allowed to do it. They weren't allowed to bring the sacrifice. You had to be in a state of spiritual purity. So page 778 in the article Chumash, it says, so what happened the, uh, when they were bringing the uh, sacrifice, the Paschal Lamb, there were a group of people that were impure. So what happened? They couldn't bring the, they couldn't bring the sacrifice. They couldn't do all the mitzvahs of Pesach. So it says, So it says, They said, We were impure. We said to Moshe, Why did they say we were impure? They said, Why did they say we were impure? They said, Why did they say we were impure? They said to Moshe, 
Why should we lose out? We were impure. Why should we lose out that we can't bring this sacrifice with the rest of the Jewish people? Stay here and I will ask Hashem what Hashem wants you to do. And of course we know Hashem says that a month later, a month after Pesach, for those people that were Tameh, were impure, they can bring the Korban Pesach a month later, the 14th day of Iyar, which is a month after Pesach, and they can make up the mitzvah like that. Okay, straightforward enough. They were upset that they didn't, weren't not able to participate in the um, Korban Pesach, the Paschal offering. So they said, Moshe, we're very upset. We want to be able to do this mitzvah. So he speaks to Hashem, and Hashem tells him, okay, you do it a month later and make up for it. So Rukadal Yashor uh, has a very nice piece on this. I originally heard this from uh, Rabbi Berzan, who was the uh, Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the Yeshiva in Mivaseret. It's a very, very powerful piece, I think. Uh, and actually, interestingly enough, for those people listening in Manalapan, Rav Gedalia Shor was Rabbi Nathan Shor's uncle, who Rabbi Nathan Shor was the rabbi at Sons of Israel for many years. So he says, really, this parsha should have been said by Moshe, right? It's an interesting thing here. This is one of the few parshas, few examples in the Torah, where people actually, the Jewish people, came to Moshe. Moshe asked Hashem, and Hashem therefore tells a mitzvah based on the request of the people. That doesn't always happen. Usually, it's most of the time, it's Moshe telling the people what to do. So he starts off by discussing this with a with an interesting story that's brought in the Zohar. Right, the Zohar, Kabbalistic work. He says that there was a uh, child sitting by, and he saw three Tanayim, a few Tanayim coming back uh, from a trip. Now, the Tanayim were the great sages in the times around of the uh, the Second Temple, a little later. And these sages were returning from Pidyan Shvuyim. Pidyan Shvuyim is a very big mitzvah that's rescuing a captive, someone who's taken captive, and you're ransoming him, right, saving his life, or, or from, from captivity. And that was a very big mitzvah. So these, uh, these big rabbis just performed this mitzvah of redeeming a captive, and they were returning home. And this child saw on their face and mentioned to them, Ah, I see you didn't recite Shema this morning, right? Sounds like a little bit of a chutzpah kid. Also, apparently, a very spiritual kid because he could see, right, there's such a Kabbalistic thing. You can tell on someone's face uh, which mitzvahs they haven't performed like that. So this kid uh, recognized uh, that uh, these great rabbis didn't say Shema because they were, bu- they were busy with this mitzvah of rescuing captives and they were not able to say the Shema, do the mitzvah of Shema. So they answered him. They said, we, we didn't have to read Shema. We were doing a mitzvah. We were rescuing a, a captive, right? The rule is, Osik b'mitzvah patr a mitzvah. If you're involved in a mitzvah, then you uh, don't have to do other mitzvahs. So since they were involved in the mitzvah of rescuing captives, there was no mitzvah for them to recite Shema. But Rav Gedal Yishor points out that nevertheless, the child still saw in their face that they hadn't said Shema, meaning which seems to imply that even though they had a valid excuse for not performing the mitzvah of Shema, right, they were doing Pidyan Shvuyim, rescuing captives, nevertheless, it seems like there was something off. Okay. Furthermore, there's another similar story in the Gemara, Mordechai, right? We're just talking about Hanukkah. Now, Purim, story of Purim. We all know the basic story. Haman decreed to destroy the Jewish people, and through a series of very lucky events, the Jewish people are saved, and they were saved by Mordechai and Esther. So the Gemara says that... Some of the Sanhedrin, Mordechai was on the Sanhedrin, was on the great Jewish court, and some of them didn't want to be so close to Mordechai after, after this whole thing happened. Why? Because he was not... It says, Shehaya osik b'hatzalus nefashos, upirish b'miktas, malasik b'talmat Torah. Since he was so busy with hatzalus nefashos, saving a life, he was not able to study Torah. Now, what does that mean he was saving a life? He was saving the entire Jewish people. But nevertheless, even though he was saving the entire Jewish people, which is like a huge mitzvah, obviously, he wasn't able to learn Torah. Well, obviously, he was busy saving the Jewish people. He wasn't able to learn Torah. But you see that the rabbis, they didn't want to, some of them didn't want to be so close to him because he wasn't learning Torah. Now, he was absolutely not supposed to be learning Torah. He was supposed to be saving the Jewish people. Okay. One more thing, and then we'll explain. The Taz writes, the Gemara says, that studying Torah is greater than saving a life. 
Okay, that must mean Torah is very important. But wait a minute. But also there's a law that says that if you're studying Torah and there's an opportunity to save someone's life, you have to stop and save someone's life, right? If, I, if we're learning right now and we're giving a shear and we're learning Torah, if I see somebody having a heart attack, God forbid, outside, I should shut my books and go call 911 and help them. So what does it mean that studying Torah is greater than saving a life? So with all these stories, he says that for sure studying Torah is greater. But there's a law that you have to stop if somebody is in a life-threatening situation. However, why did it happen that to Mordechai it came that he had to stop learning to save the Jewish people? Or why should it happen if we're learning Torah and the situation came to us, God forbid, where we have to save someone's life, where someone's in a life-threatening situation. Or these, these three rabbis who were walking, and they didn't say Shema, but they were, they were doing a big mitzvah of rescuing a captive. Why did it happen to them? So, Rav Gedal Yeshua points out from here that even though in all of these situations, everyone was doing the right thing. Mordechai was supposed to stop learning to save the Jewish people. The three rabbis were not supposed to say Shema. They were supposed to uh, save a captive or if someone's learning Torah and someone's and then they see someone in a life-threatening situation he's supposed to stop learning Torah in order to save them but why did that situation happen to that individual that he had to stop learning Torah and he had to stop doing the mitzvah in order to help the other person so he says that means you see that there was something lacking there was a chisaron we called not necessarily there was something lacking that that situation came about to them where they had to stop they're learning Torah, or they weren't able to perform a mitzvah. Meaning, even if you have a valid excuse why you can't perform a mitzvah, 100% valid. If you would ask the rabbi, Rabbi, should I perform this mitzvah right now? The rabbi would tell you, absolutely not. You shouldn't be doing it. But nevertheless, even though you're doing the right thing by not doing the mitzvah, it's still a taina on you. It's still, there is still somewhat of a chisarun. The fact that Hashem made that situation happen to you means there is something lacking in us, that that happened to us. Right? And I think this has to do with our attitude right? when it comes to uh, performing of mitzvahs when we don't have the opportunity. Right? We weren't able to go to shul for a very long time. So how did we feel? What was, our natu- what was our first response? Was it, oh, thank God that I don't have to go to shul, I get a break? Or was it, oh, I don't have the opportunity to go to shul? Right? How did we respond? So what's very interesting here is that even though in these scenarios they all did the right thing, they all stopped learning and they stopped doing mitzvahs so that they could do save a life or whatever that whatever had to be done. But nevertheless, it, the situation only occurred to them because there was something lacking. So now, why was the Pesach Sheni? Same thing. These people, what what were they doing? Why were they tummy? We said that they were impure and they weren't able to bring the Paschal sacrifice. Why were they impure? So one of the reasons was, there's a few reasons, one of them was, some of them were carrying the bones of Yosef. Yosef at Tzaddik had passed away in Egypt, and he didn't want to be buried in Egypt, so they were taking his bones to be buried in Israel. That's why they were impure, because someone who con- comes in contact with a corpse is spiritually impure. So they were doing mitzvahs, and what happened? Where They said, we're impure, we can't bring the Pesach, Pesach offering. So what did they do? They started analyzing their deeds. Is there anything lacking in us that Hashem made it? that we wouldn't be able to bring the Pesach sacrifice? What did we do that caused us to lose out this mitzvah, right? The first reaction was, oh, we lost the mitzvah. We couldn't do the mitzvah. What did we do wrong that we weren't able to do the mitzvah? Even though we did the right thing, we were supposed to be, in, we were supposed to be carrying the bones of Yosef. We were supposed to be come impure and not be able to bring the Pesach sacrifice. If we would have asked any rabbi at the time, they would have told us, yes, carry, Yos- carry Yosef's bones, do not bring the Pesach sacrifice. But why did that situation occur to them right why, why did why did that come up so they started analyzing their deeds did they do something wrong was it uh were, were they lacking in some way and after they analyzed uh, an honest evaluation they realized there was nothing lacking so they went to moshe and they said lama nigara why did we lose out right because it shouldn't be surprising right and many many times we have where there's a mitzvah we should perform and we can't uh, perform it you know if you uh you know like, like all those situations we mentioned before, would you, would you say, Lama Nigara? Would you say, why did we lose out? Sometimes you can't perform a mitzvah, you're sick, or you have to be doing pidyon shvuyim, saving captives. You don't say, Lama Nigara, that's the rule. You know, you don't, uh, 
You don't bring, you don't perform the mitzvah in those scenarios. But after these great people in the times of the desert, in the times of the uh, Midbar, analyzed their deeds and they realized there was nothing lacking, they said to Moshe, Lama Nigara. So the Rav Gedal Yishor writes, So what did, what did Hashem do? Since they had such a desire to perform the mitzvah, and they said, Lama Nigara, why did we lose out? Hashem made that the mitzvah would come about through their request and that they would earn a merit through that merit that this new mitzvah would become part of the Torah of Pesach Sheni. Hashem wanted specifically that they had such a desire to do the mitzvah that the mitzvah should be set in the Torah not through a command to Moshe like it usually is, but rather through the request of the Jewish people who felt cheated. They felt that they lost out, that they weren't able to perform the mitzvah. Now they could understand if there was something that they did wrong that Hashem made it, that they couldn't perform the mitzvah. But they realized there was nothing they did wrong. There was no, no, no lacking that they had. Not necessarily something they did wrong, but there was no lacking in anything that they had, that they should not be able to perform this mitzvah. So they were very upset, and they went to Moshe and said, Lama Nigara, why should we lose out? And that was a schus. And he uses the phrase, Megagolin schus ayide zakai, that merits happen to people that deserve it, to people that do the right thing and good things. And because of that, because of that merit, Hashem made that the entire Pesach, uh, Shani, that entire mitzvah came about in their merit. And not, not only in their times, but for all generations, it became part of the Torah. So again, what do we see? What's the attitude, I think, to obvious lesson from here? What's the attitude we have towards mitzvahs when we can't complete mitzvahs? Do we say, you know, we haven't been in shul for several months and we haven't been able to, to learn in a base medrash and we haven't been able to do X, Y, Z. So we say, okay, good, I needed a break. You know, uh, Hashem will understand. Hashem, Hashem can't have any complaints with me. You know, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Or do we say, Lama Nigara, why, why are we losing out? Why are we in this situation where we can't perform mitzvahs? And we analyze, you know, even though, right, you know, I ask the rabbi and the rabbi says, you're not supposed to go to shul, it's dangerous. Okay, valid, the rabbi's right, we're not supposed to go to shul. But why did we fall into that situation, right? We have to analyze, what are we lacking that we fell into that situation? And we have to say, and we also, we have to feel bad. We should feel bad that we don't have the privilege of doing these mitzvahs, right? The real test, right? Life is... Uh, is about a quest for spirituality. So what are, where do our real desires lie? Is in physical things, and that when we do uh, spiritual things, it's like paying taxes, you know, God wants us to do this, so we don't want to, but we do it anyway. Is that how we view it? Or do we view it as, no, this is a tremendous opportunity to get close to Hashem and to live for our, whole, our, our true purpose. And when we don't have those opportunities, we feel bad. We say, Lama Nigara, why are we, why are we losing out? So, uh... Hopefully, we can all have that attitude, and uh, as we learn uh, more Torah and do more mitzvahs, we'll develop that attitude more and more. Again, it's not all or nothing. It's uh, Life is a, is a ladder, always climbing up the ladder, and if anyone has any questions, as always, please feel free to email me, or message me on Facebook, or whatever is easiest, and I hope everybody has a beautiful day.